Um, on the web page, uh, if you've uh, looked at it, um, I put up a little video uh, illustrating the R script for um, doing the linear regression. So we've gone over the theory behind linear regression in class, and now you have this video um, which shows you how to do the R script, how to, how to set up that analysis. Um, I added a little addendum to that um, just the other day, um, which uh, is actually uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about today, um, and that is this, if you've, if you've looked at that video clip, then what you've seen um, is this graph, um, and this is day down here, Oh, yeah. And this is weight here, and we have these data points. And this was uh, really sort of one of those fortuitous kind of projects that just uh, right, right person at the right time, everything just came into, into play just perfectly. Um, I had a pair of red-tailed boas. Actually, I had three red-tailed boas in my office. I have a, had, at that time, a big enclosure for these guys, and I had these three large snakes. They, the biggest one was about nine feet long, and then the shortest one was about six and a half feet long. And I had, I had never, they were easy to deal with, easy to feed most of the time. And uh, one day I came into my office and it smelled a little bit funny when I walked into the office and I go, oh, and then I looked in that enclosure and I had baby snakes everywhere. And what red-tailed boas do is they give live birth. So they retain the eggs and the eggs are then hatch inside the female. And then she, so at some point along the way, two of these animals copulated and the result was, I don't know, it was, 40 some odd, almost 50 baby red-tailed boas. Um, so we kept 20 of the snakes, got rid of 30 of them. I was selling them, giving them away, you know, just I was just unloading red-tailed boas everywhere I could. I think I drove half the pet stores in Cape Girardeau out of business by doing that, but so be it. And uh, but I kept 20 of these snakes, and I had a graduate student, and she divided these 20 baby snakes up into two groups. And one group got fed every week, every seven days. The other group got fed every 14 days. And every snake got a baby mouse or something like that every week or every other week. And she weighed every snake once a week, and she weighed all the waste products that every snake produced, all the shed skins. She weighed the mice or the pinkies that were fed to the snakes, so everything, she has perfect records of everything. And the data that I provided you with are the data from a single snake um, over this one year period. So she kept these animals for a year, and every week she would weigh them and do all of that. And then her thesis was looking at allometric growth in these animals. So we're using those data as a linear regression example. And last time we figured out how to get that regression line. Um, and on the video, in addition to getting the regression line, you also get the confidence intervals for the regression line. And the confidence interval has a shape, I'm not drawing it to scale, that looks something like that. So the confidence interval is narrowest right there in the middle. And there's a reason for that. That's because that point is x bar, y bar. Okay. okay? And I have 95% confidence intervals for x, which go like that. And I have 95% confidence intervals for y, which goes like that. So I could define this 95% confidence circle around that point. So I know the point is somewhere in there. Now, in R, I also get the standard error of the estimate for the slope, which means I can do the t-test to find out if the slope is significant or not. 
or we get that basically from the ANOVA table, right? But I get that, and now I know that the slope might be either a little bit higher or a little bit lower. I can have the 95% confidence intervals for the slope. So my slope might be a little bit steeper or a little bit shallower. And that's what gives these confidence intervals, those bands like that. And on that graph, when you notice, when you look at it, I think the regression line is in red and the confidence interval for the line is in blue. Most of the points are outside of the confidence interval. That's fine. The confidence intervals are not for the points. The confidence intervals are for the line. Okay? So most of the points are out there. And it looks good. And the regression is significant and all of that. And you feel very good about it. On the addendum video, what I've done is I've looked at the residuals. The residuals are the deviations of these points from the line. So those are my error terms, my individual error terms. And the way we plot those is like this. Now what I'm doing is I have day on this axis, and I'm taking the regression line, and it has this nice slope, and I'm laying it down horizontally. And I indicate it with the dashed bar, like that. Okay? And now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the deviations of the points from the regression line. Under a perfect scenario, all my points would be around that line just like that. Okay? But when you look at the plot that you get from R when doing this, and I recommend that you do it just for grins and giggles, I'm not going to ask you to turn it in. But when you do that, what you'll discover is the points actually look like this. Okay? So the point, even though that's the best fit line, the points, the data points, aren't perfectly distributed around the regression line. And if you think about it, it really looks something like that. And what R does is it gives you this little sort of mean deviation line that goes through there, and it shows you where sort of the curvature of those points is. When you see that kind of a residual plot, you know that something is wrong. All right? Well, when Rachel Arnold analyzed her data, she had been in experimental design, and she right away, even without looking at the data, knew that that approach was the wrong approach. So using a regression analysis, a straight linear regression like this, is wrong. And you know it's wrong because all you have to do is look at this graph. The residuals are not evenly distributed across that line. There is some systematic bias. So the first thing that comes to mind should be obvious. And that is, well, we're expecting these snakes to grow in a linear fashion. Do humans grow in a linear fashion? No, you don't. Do dogs, cats grow in a linear fashion? No, you don't. At first, when my son was born, I had a scale, a grocer scale, and I would weigh him every day for the first year of his life. I weighed him every day. And I used the data in experimental design years ago. Right? He would kill me if I used him now, but back then, he was cool with it. And what you discover is a newborn baby, the first week of life, they're losing weight. And then they start putting it on. And the graph looks something like this, right? I mean, it goes down, and then it goes up, and then it begins to taper off a little. That's not a line. Okay, it's not linear. 
It's some sort of a curvilinear relationship. So the first thing that goes to your mind is, well, probably a linear regression is not correct. That line should probably be curved. So one thing we want to explore, instead of using a linear regression, we want to use some sort of a curve. And we can do that with something called a polynomial regression. Okay? So that, that's one thing that we can deal with. Very good. Let's imagine the points had a slightly different kind of distribution around the regression line. Let's imagine, and this is relatively common, that the points do something like this. In other words, if we look at the distribution of the points, we notice that as we go to larger values of day, the variability in the data increases. Well, that too is a problem. This is the sort of problem we can solve relatively easily. What would you do if you had data that looked like that when you plotted the residuals? What approach would you take? You see, there's some systematic bias in the data that, need to be, that, need, that needs to be addressed. Well, if the variance is increasing as day gets larger, are there any other things that increase with time? I mean, let's, let's think about it. Let's imagine we were going to measure body weights in people. Okay? So, what's the, how variable are body weights in little babies? Well, not very much, right? Little babies, if, if it, unless it's a premature okay. birth. You know, six to eight pounds, something like that is where most of it. So it's pretty narrow. But by the time you become an adult, the variation in body size is, is pretty large. Here on campus, you can find students that weigh everything from under 100 pounds uh, to well north of 500 pounds. Okay, so the amount of variation in the data becomes larger with time. That's exactly what's happening here. Mm -hmm. What we might consider doing is something to change that variability. And what we can do, and what is oftentimes done in data, biologists almost do this without even thinking. Even without looking at the box plots, or even without looking at these residual plots, oftentimes biologists will just automatically take the log, the natural log, of the data. So if it's body weights, you take the natural log of the data. What does that do? If you have numbers that get really big like that, when you take the natural log, what you're doing is you're taking this part of it and pulling it down because the graph for the natural log looks like that. So as the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger, you're pulling them down and they become less extreme. Or, rather than take the natural log, you might also just take the square root of your variable or of your response variable. And that makes sense because a lot of the things that we measure are a consequence of area, wing area, surface area, right? Something along those, or you might take the cube root. If you're measuring mass, wait, cube root is perfect because what is mass? It's really a measure of volume. What's volume? Length times length times length, length cubed. 
What's area? Length squared. So by taking the cube root, you're pulling it down. Okay? Now, when you take the log, there is a potential pitfall. Does anybody have a sense of what it might be? What's the, what's the graph of the natural log look like? Okay? So what's the natural log of 1? Zero. All right? What's the natural log of 0.1? A really big negative number. What's the natural log of 0 0.001? Like a really yeah. big negative number. And if you get very much smaller, you're approaching negative infinity very quickly. So usually when we take the natural log of a number, if you have zero, if you're trying to take the natural log of zero, what is the natural log of zero? It's minus infinity. So what's the solution? If you have any observations that are smaller than one, or if you have any 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 observations that are zero and you're taking the natural log, you're screwed. So what's the solution? Natural log plus one? The natural log of the variable plus one. So if x is your variable, mm -hmm. instead of taking the natural log of x, you take the natural log of x plus one. And now the smallest thing it could be, right, would be one, which would be your new zero. Sometimes editors will go, what? What are you doing? And so what's the expected value of x? x bar. What's the expected value of x plus a constant? x bar plus a constant. So you, you've really not changed anything at all. Okay, so that's the trick to apply there. All right. I have, in fact, where did I put it? I had, I was here just a minute ago, I lost it somewhere in this classroom. It was a sheet of paper. It got wet. I threw the wet part away. It's lost. It's gone. It disappeared. See? Proof there is a God that doesn't like me. I don't know where it is. Um, I have a whole sheet that shows what to do, how to transform your data if your data are not normally distributed. So if your data aren't behaving properly, what to do. It's pretty clear if the points look something like that, you need to do some sort of polynomial regression. If they're too big at this end, a log or a square root transformation, something of that sort. But there is no rule that says you have to stick to either a square root or a natural log transformation. Oftentimes, people will use data that are percentages. So percent something. Do you see a potential problem with using percentage data and then trying to do some kind of analysis? Well, yeah. Because if you're using percentages, percentages are between 0 and 1. Well. If your data fall between 0 and 1, they are not normally distributed. They are binomially distributed. So you now have to apply a data transformation so that instead of being like that, instead of being binomial, they are normal. And there the appropriate transformation is the arcsine transformation. And the arcsine transformation is simply to take the square root of your, the arcsine of the square root of your percentage score. And that will then give you something which is approximately normal. I'll give you a table if I ever find that sheet somewhere around here. And I will make that available on the web page. So suggested transformations for data that have certain properties. OK. The other plot, uh, you get a whole series of plots when you use the um, the plot command uh, in ggplot. OK, 
Uh, on the video, I, I talk about ggplot2. Um, I didn't capitalize day, and I was trying to figure out what, what, what went wrong and for about like 15 minutes, and I realized because I didn't capitalize yeah, day. Yeah, it, it's computers, <laughs> computers are stupid. You know, they can't figure anything out. Yeah. There is another plot in there, and that's called the QQ plot. Okay, and what that it refers to is the quantile quantile plot. So you're looking at the plot of the theoretical distribution, which is normal, versus the the observed distribution of the residuals. And if the observed probability distribution of your residuals is exactly like the theoretical normal distribution, then all of those observations are going to fall on a line of isometry. There will be a one-to-one -one match. But what you notice when you look at your points, they do something like this. So the slope of your observed residuals is somewhat shallower than the theoretical distribution. And what that means is that, is that the distribution of your residuals is somewhat leptokurtic. That is, your residuals are more clumped than the theoretical distribution. So if this is the normal distribution, your distribution is more like that. It's more leptokurtic. If the slope is steeper, then your distribution is platycurtic. It's more flattened out. But it's clear from that that we don't have a very nice match between our observed and the theoretical distribution. The good news is that linear regression is relatively robust. Okay? So these sorts of, de these sorts of deviations aren't all that bad. You can still, you still, you're depending on what you're trying to do with your data. If you're trying to, to predict is it okay to launch the space shuttle or is it okay to, you know, launch this rocket, maybe not. If you're trying to say, okay, is this vaccine good enough and won't kill too many people, probably not. But if all you're doing is trying to understand the growth rates, growth trajectories of red-tailed boas, you're probably fine. Okay? All right. So let's take our regression model now um, and let's um, do something which is kind of clever. Okay? Uh, what I want to do is show you a spline. Oh, uh, before I do that, uh, let's go back and think about our distribution of residuals. I said that the possibilities the, obviously, the linear model doesn't match, okay? It's not the correct model. We should be using some polynomial model, perhaps, something like that. Even if I used a polynomial model for those data, I would still be wrong. And the question is why. So, we've got this. There's our regression line. We get these really nice, tight, confidence interval bands. That all looks good. Looking at it, the fit of the date, it's still wrong. Even if I do the polynomial regression, it's not going to look much different from this. It's still going to be wrong. Why? And this goes back to the basic fundamentals. All right? The fundamentals of what these data are. If I have this snake, all these data are for one snake. And I weighed it on day 7, and on day 14, and on day 21, and on day 28, throughout the entire year. I didn't weigh them. Rachel Arnold weighed them. Okay? And she knew what was wrong, right? The question, she had been through the class, what's wrong with these data? What's wrong with what we're trying to do? Let's... Oh, okay. Is it because you're, again, trying to fit the 
nonlinear growth pattern into yeah. the No, I, I can make I can make a polynomial yeah. regression and fit it perfectly. Something screwy. Let's think about the stock market. And we're going to do that here, hopefully, before we go to shutdown. I'm going to give you a data set that has the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1893 all the way to present, 2020. Okay. If you look at the growth of the stock market, see there's 1929. It is something like that. Okay. Anybody know what the stock market did yesterday? You guys probably don't have any stocks or anything of that sort, so it doesn't make any goddamn difference to you. Yesterday was not a good day. Yesterday, and the nor was the day before, and I'm looking at that and said, well, okay, I could work till I'm 75, that'd be all right. I could do it. It tanked, okay? And it tanked the day before. Why did it tank? Why is the stock market going into the toilet? Yeah, well, that, that happens on a daily basis. Or somebody said something really smart. Either somebody one of, said something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so suddenly all these reports coming out of the CDC say, hey, man, this COVID shit, it's bad news. You know, it's, it's like, no, it's not going to go away by election day or any of that sort of stuff. So. Uh, Wall Street has finally come to the realization that, okay, maybe Trump isn't right and it isn't going to magically disappear, and that we're, we're entering fall and we're not in a good place, and we have the highest death rate in the world, and we have you know, the highest rate of infection in the world, and all that sort of stuff. It's bad news, all right? And Wall Street, so Wall Street, going like that, I was just <coughs> dropping off a cliff. I don't know what it's done today, but the last two and a half days have been brutal. Okay. So, let's go back three days. The value of the stock market, I don't know, 28,000, okay? How did it get to 28,000? I can remember as a kid when the stock market was going, shooting past 600 and it was getting up to about 800. And I'm going, holy shit, how long can this go on? And I talked to a, a friend of my father's, and I asked this guy because he was an accountant of one sort or another, and I said, man, how, how much higher can the stock market go? And he says, oh, it can go as high as it wants. You know, there's, it doesn't make any difference. It can go up and up and up and up and up. And I had a hard time imagining that because I thought it would be somehow limited, but it's not. It got there based on where it was the day before. Okay, so it's come, yeah, it's come. Okay? Just like your body weight today is not independent of your body weight yesterday. And when you're doing this regression, you're making this assumption that the body weight today is independent of its body weight from seven days ago. And it's not. Okay? In other words, your weight today is correlated with your weight from last week. What that means is those little residuals, remember our model, y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x of i plus epsilon i, okay? Epsilon i and epsilon i plus 1 are correlated. They're not independent. And just as in ANOVA, we made this assumption that those epsilons were independent. 
and they're not. They're correlated with one another. That's okay. I don't care. Because what we can do now, that we think about it, we can remove those correlations. So we can do the regression in a slightly different way. What we can add in here are terms that are designed to remove those correlations between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. And we can remove the correlation between epsilon 1 and epsilon 3. And we can remove it between epsilon 1 and epsilon 4. And epsilon 2 and 3, and 2 and 4, and 2 and 5, and so on. So we can remove all of those out of correlations. And what we end up with then is a model here, which has taken all of that into account and shows you what the relationship is. And we can keep removing these until the correlation between one and the other is zero. And when the correlation between epsilon i and epsilon i plus i n is equal to zero, we know, OK, from that point on, these things are statistically independent. And we can do the same thing here with the stock market. So when we finally are ready to do that analysis, we're going to do something called an autoregression. It's a time series regression where we're going to remove the effects of that correlation between one day's close and the next day's close. What we will do is we'll compare the growth of the stock market under Ronald Reagan with Bill Clinton, with George Bush 1, George Bush 2, Obama, and Trump. Okay? And we'll see under whose presidency, once you remove those out of correlations, the stock market actually did best. Now, you have most students have this sense that, oh, the stock market always does better under Republicans. So they expect that under Reagan it did best, and under Bush it would have done great, under Bush won, and so on. And under Trump, the expectation is that it will have been fantastic. But when you analyze the data, it turns out not to be true. The stock market did not do particularly well under the Republican presidents. It did extremely well under Clinton, and it did extremely well under Obama. And now I haven't analyzed the data for Trump, but just eyeballing it, it's not going to be particularly good for Trump. Okay? Does that mean the Republicans are not good for the economy? No. What it means is their view of the economy is not your view of the economy. Right? They're focusing on other sorts of things. All right. So now, with that out of the way, we're going to come back to those sorts of autoregressions um, a little later on. Uh, the next thing that I want to do, though, is this. I want to show you a little trick. When we do a regression, we don't have to limit ourselves to a model that looks like this. Y i is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus epsilon i. <coughs> what we could do is we could have another term in there. We could do this. yi is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 xi. Make sure that's a random variable. xi plus beta 2 xi squared plus epsilon i. Now what I've done, instead of just having a line, I could have, depending on whether that coefficient is positive or negative, I could have a curve. Or I could do yi is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 xi plus beta 2 xi squared plus beta 3 xi cubed plus epsilon i. And now I could have a curve that looks something like that. So it's a third order polynomial, a second order polynomial, a first order polynomial. 
or line. Okay? I can add as many of these terms as I want. That's a third order, that's a second order, that's a first order. And I can improve the quality of my fit with each additional term. Okay? So this is referred to as a polynomial regression. It's easy to do. But let's do this. Let's do it just a little bit differently. Let's imagine we want to look at the relationship between variable x and y for whatever species that we happen to be looking at. Maybe it's boas. And we have body weights for males and females. And we're going to take a male and a female. We have their body weights. But we recognize that one is male and the other is female. Or maybe you're looking at fish, right? You're catching fish, and you're looking at weight of the fish, and length of the fish, and sex of the fish. And what you think is that if this is length, and this is weight, okay, you think that there's going to be some sort of linear relationship like that. Weight, you take the cube root of weight because Weight is length times width times height, right? It's a volume. That's just a length. So then you're going to have a better fit, right? Your data aren't going to be weird because that's this cube thing rather than a linear thing. But you've got males and females, and you're thinking, I wonder if the relationship between weight and length is different for males and females. What the naive student would do is do the regression for the males and then do the regression for the females. So you do the regression twice. And then, after you've done that, you would say, okay, let's now compare the beta coefficient, the slope, for males with the slope for females and see if they're the same. Or you might say, I think the slopes are going to be the same, but maybe the intercepts are going to be different. So you could also do a t-test and discover if the intercepts are equal. So you'd compute one regression line for males, and you could compute a different regression line for females. Okay? And then you could do the t-test. Are the slopes the same? Yes or no? Are the intercepts the same? Yes or no? That would be the brute force approach. And that's usually what you see in a scientific paper. And it's also the lame approach. There's a much more elegant way to do it. And that elegant way is to use something called an indicator variable. So let's add a new variable to the system. Okay. I'm going to add a variable x2. And x2 is going to be equal to 0 if my fish is a male. And it's going to be equal to 1 if my fish is a female. Okay? So now my regression model looks like this. Beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus epsilon. There's a reason why I've used 0 and 1. A lot of people, especially Graduate students, when they score their data in their spreadsheet, they'll put M for male and F for female. Or they'll use 1 for female and 2 for male, or something like that. And that's wrong. Use 0 and 1s. Why? Why use zeros and 1s? Because 0 and 1 follow a binomial distribution. 
Okay. What's the sum of two binomial distributions? Well, you could do that in Excel. Years ago, in experimental design, I would have the students open up an Excel spreadsheet and generate a column of a thousand random numbers that would have the values between 0 and 1. And they would then produce the graph. And the graph looks like this. There's 0, there's 1, and it ends up being a uniform distribution. Then I would have them repeat the same thing, only this time have two columns of 0 to 1, and a third column where they added those two columns together. So now the numbers go from 0 to 2. And I would ask them to plot those. Now it looks like that. Then I do three columns, four columns, five columns, six columns. By the time you get to six columns and you plot those, the sums of those things, you get a curve that looks like that. In other words, by the time you've taken six binomial random variables and added them together, you're indistinguishable from a normal distribution. So if you have a lot of data, right, you're getting close to a normal distribution. So that's one reason for doing it like this. The other reason for doing it like this is as follows. We have y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x2 plus epsilon. If we have a male, what does this regression equation become? It becomes y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1. x2 is equal to 0 for males. So 0 times beta 2 is 0 plus epsilon. If it's a female, Then we have y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 times 1, which is beta 2, plus epsilon. Hey, let's rewrite that. Let's write that as y equals paren beta 0 plus beta 2 plus beta 1 x1 plus epsilon. So this is equivalent to saying this. Here's my line for males. Here's my line for females. It has exactly the same slope, but the intercepts are different. This one has the intercept beta 0. This one has the intercept beta 0 plus beta 1. There's beta 0. There's beta 0 plus beta 1. And I now know that males, if, if beta 2 turns out to be significant, I know that males and females are different. They have different intercepts. Okay. Hey. Let's do this. Let's make the model just a little bit more interesting. Let's take y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 1 2 x1, x2, plus epsilon. In other words, here I have the product of x1 and x2. It's a little bit like, if you think about the models that you used in ANOVA, it's a little, it is like an interaction term. Okay? 
Now, let's remember, x2 is equal to 0 if male and 1 if female. Let's see what happens for the male. So x1, x2 is, e if x2 is equal to 0 if it's male. So now I have y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus Beta 2 times 0 plus beta 1, 2 times x1 times 0, which is 0 plus epsilon. Now let's look what we get if we have a female. Now I have y equals beta 0 plus beta 1, x1 plus beta 2 plus beta 1, 2 times x1 times 1 times 1 plus epsilon. So now that's the same as y equals beta 0 plus beta 2. There's my new intercept. Plus, here I have x1, there I have x1. So plus beta 1 plus beta 1, 2 times x1 plus epsilon. So now I have a new intercept and I have a new slope. Okay? So when I graph it, there's my line for males. There's my line for females. So if the intercept is different, I change that. If it turns out that beta 1, 2 is significant, I also have a different slope. So in, instead of running the regression twice and doing this complicated t-test to find out are the intercepts different? Are the slopes the same? All that's right. I can just run the regression once, have all these additional degrees of freedom to work with, a more powerful regression, and answer the same question in a very elegant way. Does the point where the line intersects, does that have any, um, any value? That would depend on the system. Okay. You know, and yeah. it might make biological sense. Yeah. You know, if you really know your system. Okay, there's one more little trick that I want to show you before we move on. All right, so you should keep that idea of indicator variables tattooed on the surface of your brain. Tattoo it on the inside of your wrist, whatever it takes, you know, just indicator variables. You're not restricted to just one indicator variable. You can use lots of indicator variables. I once did this project I got as a graduate student in, when I was in New Mexico. Um, I got paid um, to do, be a, a statistician for this project for the uh, Smithsonian Institution. Uh, there were a group of botanists, paleobotanists, that were going down to Costa Rica and Panama uh, every year, and they would bring back all these pollen samples. And they'd be in the field for three months every year, and then they'd spend nine months every year analyzing these pollen samples. And they gave me these pollen, they gave me these data that they were measuring from these pollen samples, and they were asking the question, can you tell the difference? Is there some sort of dichotomous key that we can develop for these pollen things? So there are all sorts of different tricks that I used, but one of the things that I did was I set up this, this dichotomy where I had these indicator variables. Is the shape of the pollen ovoid or round? Is it this? Each one of those was an indicator variable. So I set up this system 
or I can analyze the data just with indicator variables, just zeros and ones, zeros and ones, zeros and ones. So I had like 20 or 30 different indicator variables to describe all these things. And then I ran this analysis, and bammo whammo, I could almost perfectly, almost with perfect precision, I could separate all these pollen grains into the appropriate species using just those indicator variables. So you, you're not restricted to just one or two indicator variables. You can have as many as you need. The only limit is how many degrees of freedom do you have? Because you always have to have enough degrees of freedom left over for the air term. All right. One more essential topic before we move on. And that is this. So far, when we've done our regression, we've done this. This is x. This is y. There's our regression line. We fitted that regression line using the method of least squares. So method of least squares. So we took the partial derivatives, right, of we generated this pair of equations, these partial derivatives, um, for the deviation of, um, of the points from the line, okay? And we chose the best value of beta 0 and beta 1 and called it B0 and B1 that would minimize that. So we had this function. And what we produced was this pair of equations referred to as the normal equations. So that's called the method of least squares. We're just creating this function and then minimizing it. So, And what we know then is that the solution to that equation is x bar comma y bar. So that's one solution. And we also know that the slope of that regression is the covariance of x and y divided by the variance of x. Okay. The problem is, if I flip these axes, put x up here and y here, and repeat the analysis, and compute the new slope, so the slope for x against y instead of y against x, what you would think in your head is that, oh, to go back to the way it was, all I have to do is take the inverse of this. So it would be the variance of x over the covariance of x and y. And it turns out that you don't get the same result. Why is it important? For many years, so just as an example, for many years I was working on uh, estimating the cost of transport for flying squirrels. I worked on not just flying squirrels. I did this for uh, gliding geckos. I did it for sugar gliders. I did it for squirrel gliders in Australia. Uh, I did it for southern flying squirrels and for northern flying squirrels. And I also did it for the giant Japanese flying squirrel. Okay? And the way squirrels glide, right, they they climb up to the top of a tree, and they glide down like that, and then they climb up again. All right? So to go from here to here requires climbing and gliding. OK, if you want, you only really need to look at the climb ones. But you glide, and then climb back up to your launch height. What I want to know is how far they have to glide in order for that to be energetically feasible. So I have I had all these different ways of estimating what the metabolic rate is and what the metabolic expenditure is and power and, and you know work and energy and all those all those sorts of things and measured all of that. But the critical thing I needed to know was how high the animal had to glide to climb in order to glide a specific distance. Okay? So I wanted to predict something from how far the animal had glided. So I ended up doing it bass backwards. What I, what I want to do is predict how far it glides from how far it climbs. But what I have to do is do it opposite in order to 
find all the parameter values for this model. So I have exactly the raw information in order to use the method of least squares to get my regression. I've got it backwards. What I want is x to get y, but what I've got is y, and I'm trying to predict x. So the first time I wrote a paper on this, that's how I did it. I did it just like this. Did the regression, and nobody caught it. The paper went through, got published, no worries. And now, in all the years since, I, every time I look at that paper, I go, damn, shit. Do I publish a retraction? What the hell do I do? I've repeated the analysis, and it doesn't make enough of a difference to warrant a retraction, but there it is. Here's the solution. Instead of doing the method of least squares, what we want to do is what's called a reduced major axis regression. Okay. It's called an RMA regression. Now, there are some nice things about RMA regression and some not so nice things about an RMA regression. The way an RMA regression works is that the line that we're going to draw the slope of that line is simply going to be the variance of y divided by the variance of x. So we're not looking at the covariance, we're just looking at the variances. And that will produce a line that goes through the points, right? It's not the same as the least square solution. It's not minimizing the squares, the square deviations, but it does fit the points. The problem comes once we have that beta, beta 1, once we have it, how do we determine whether it's significantly different from 0 or not? That's a problem. Okay? That's the challenging part of doing the reduced major axis regression. Well, you can look at your coefficient of determination. You can do all of that sort of stuff, right? You can sort of get a sense for how well it fits. But aside from that, you're limited in your ability to assess statistical significance in a, rel in a straightforward, easy way. It's going to be more complicated to do that. That doesn't mean it isn't valuable. What it does mean is that these axes are now flippable. And if all you're doing is trying to estimate a parameter value, it's fine. So you can produce the graph, show, look, it fits reasonably well, it seems to be okay. We're just going to assume that the correct, this is close to the correct value and take it from there. All right. Now, that whole notion of reduced major axis regression is sort of interesting for the following reason. And this is something that we're going to do probably after we go into shutdown, okay, after we go to the distance learning model again. Here's where that idea comes into play. How many of you have ever done a principal components analysis? A PCA? You've done a PCA, so do you know how PCA works? Um, kind of, I, I just know we did it in uh, God, when was that? Like, towards the beginning of the semester, jealous. We didn't do it by hand, it was just in... Um, in Morpho-J. Yeah. Yeah. All right, here's what we're doing. Let's imagine we have height and weight for students. Okay? So we know how tall the students are, this is height, and this is weight. 
if you were to plot those data, you would recognize pretty quickly that there is a relationship between height and weight. So we can plot all the data points. We'd get something that looks like that. Okay? You have two variables, and you know that somehow those variables are correlated. It might be that instead of having two variables, you have a hundred variables. And you know that buried within those 100 variables are all these possible collinearities, these correlations. You don't want to deal with a hundred variables. You'd like to deal with something that's simpler. Or let's imagine we're trying to understand this election. And what we'd like to be able to do is look at somebody's somebody's socioeconomic status and so on, and try and figure out, try and classify them as being either Republican or Democrat. Could we do it? We could, easily, all right? But we don't want to, when we go up to, when we try and make that decision, we all right, so how much do you make a year? Um, how, how far did you get in school? Um, where do you go to church? Uh, how big is the city that you live in? You know, how much do you make every year? You, you know, what's your shoe size? What's your waist? You know, do you ever eat at Hardee's? You know, you're not going to add, you, you know, all that stuff. You don't want to think about all those disparate variables, even though they might all be somehow related. So what you can do is you can simplify this. There's a lot of redundancy of information in here. You can use reduced major axis regression to put that line through there like that. Okay? And when you do that, we can draw another line which is perpendicular to that one. Like that. If you think about it, what we've done, the only thing we've done is we picked up this coordinate system and shifted it up over here and rotated it. We've just changed our point of view. The data points themselves have not changed. And it makes no difference if we're talking about two-dimensional space or 200-dimensional space. It's the same. We can think about three dimensions. It's harder to think about four dimensions, but it, mathematically, it's all the same. So now we've picked up this coordinate system, shifted it over, rotated it, and now we can get rid of these axes right here. And we're going to call this one PC1. We're going to call this one PC2. Do you notice anything? Let's take these and now rotate them. Let, move back over here. There's PC2. There's PC1. Now here are all of our data points. And now suddenly you realize that there is no longer any correlation between this axis and that axis. Here we had a correlation. There it went. Now they're uncorrelated. So this axis is said to be orthogonal to this axis. They are statistically independent. Okay? Which is nice, because what that means, if I have two groups in here, I can now use a t-test to compare this group with this group, and I can compare the same two groups along this axis, and all my other axes, they're all statistically independent, so I don't have to do any kind of Bayesian correction, because, I'm, because all these things are statistically independent from one another. Better yet, notice what happens along this first axis. Most of the variation in the data occurs along that first axis. Relatively little occurs across the second axis. So here I had a two-variable system. Here I might have 95% of the variance on the first axis and only 5% on the second axis. 
So I might say, hey, I don't even need to worry about the second axis. All the information I really need is here on this first axis. Now, when you have two variables, it's not that big of a deal. But if you have 100 variables, you might be able to take those 100 variables and condense it down to three axes. Now, instead of talking about 100 different variables, you can talk about three axes. And each one is a linear combination of the others. Now, mathematically, the way this is done, it's basically a reduced major axis regression. But really, the way it's done is by using linear algebra, and we're solving the characteristic equation, right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit different, okay? But it is basically the same idea. All right. So let's now, we'll come back to doing principal components analysis a little bit later. What I want to do now is this. I want to look at a slightly different um, sort of a problem. Okay? I once worked on this project years ago. Um, there was a, an effort in um, I, I grew up in Los Angeles and uh, at that time was doing a lot of work out in the Mojave. Um, and I got involved in a project uh, that was in the Four Corners and Bullhead City area. Uh, so right there at the junction of Arizona, um, Nevada, and California. Um, and that, all that land is BLM land, uh, the Bureau of Land Management land. Um, and BLM land is awesome stuff. If you ever get a chance to be out west, uh, it's awesome. Um, mo the BLM is the largest land holder in the country. And they have, the acreage that they have is just absolutely fantastic. And a lot of it is in really nice condition because oftentimes they take good care. It's been a little bit different the last um, number of years because um, th there's been a fair bit of turmoil in BLM because of the whole political environment and uh, you can't put a truck tower everywhere. So there are some issues there. But um, at any rate, there was a, one of the things that happens out in the desert is that BLM land is used for cattle. Uh, there's a lot of free-range cattle on BLM land. Um, and the, the ranchers have to pay the federal government to run their cattle on that land. Uh, so they don't get to do it for free. Um, and how much they pay is published in the, um, is all published and available. It's all you know, public information. But if you ever go up to a rancher and ask them, hey, what's it costing you per head to run your cattle on BLM land? They don't want to tell you. Now, when Ronald Reagan was uh, president, uh, one of the first things that he did was he changed how much ranchers had to pay. Uh, when Ronald Reagan became president, it cost 25 cents a head to run your cattle on BLM land. That's 25 cents per head per year. Okay, So even back in, in 1980, I think you would have been hard pressed to feed a steer for an entire year in a feedlot for 25 cents, okay? So he raised that from 25 cents to 75 cents. And all these ranchers who had voted for Ronald Reagan because he had been in all those cowboy movies, they were outraged. They were so upset. They felt so betrayed. But they went with it. Well, now the cost of running your cattle on BLM land per head per year changes every year, depending on range conditions and the economy and all that sort of stuff. Um, the last time I looked, and this was a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was $1.16 a head per year. So this is in 2016. That's pretty damn cheap, okay? Well, so what the ranchers would like to do is they'd like to run more cattle out there. And in order to run cattle on BLM land, you have to have water. Um, so what they do is they put in these 
cattle tanks and these little windmills to pump water into the tanks. And in um, so doing, you have this water source. So that every time the wind blows, the, the blades turn, and it's pumping water up into this tank. And the tanks are actually pretty cool, because the bats come to drink and feed at those tanks because of the insects. Frogs show up. Old birds come out. Coyotes spend a lot of time in. All this wildlife comes to those tanks, but the cattle come as well. So you'll have a cattle tank right there, right? And all these cattle are coming in from miles away every day to get a drink of water. So they're converging on this point. Now, one of the species that is of concern, conservation concern, out there in that part of the country is a kangaroo rat, a Stevens kangaroo rat. And Stevens kangaroo rat builds these burrows, and of course the cattle come in, step on the burrows, crush all the burrows, crush all the kangaroo rats. So essentially all the vegetation for a certain area around that cattle tank becomes totally destroyed as does all the ground and as does all the mounds for the kangaroo rats. So my job was to figure out what the area of effect of that cattle tank was. So how far out do you have to go before you can say that at least the kangaroo rats have a 50% chance of survival or occupancy? So how would you answer that question? Well, what we did was we did these transects out from the cattle tank like that. And then we trapped. And we started here at the center and went out until we caught the first kangaroo rat. And we did that on each of these transects. So what we're plotting then is simply this. This is distance. And then we're plotting the probability of seeing a kangaroo rat. Did you catch a kangaroo rat at that distance? Yes or no? Zero or one? Okay. Well, zeros. No, no. Caught a bunch of them up here. Notice the response variable is binomial. So this now is a little bit different. We're not, it's not like we're using an indicator variable. We are using an indicator variable. But in this case, the indicator variable is the response variable. Well, how to do that regression? even a little bit. Okay? That stinks. Because if that's the regression, I know that at that point right there, I'm going to have a negative probability of seeing kangaroo rats, and I know that's not true. So what do I do? Plus, I know that I can't have a probability that's larger than one. So I know that's not the right solution. And I know it's not going to be a polynomial regression because I can't imagine a single polynomial that would match those data in any reasonable sort of way. So what to do? Well, 
if you think about it, I mean, you've, you've confronted those sorts of data before. Only you've always had stuff in the middle here, too. Okay? But you've seen that sort of stuff before. Think about population growth. How does population growth go? I mean, well, had, you know, if we're talking about growth of rabbits or growth of the human population or growth of coyotes or whatever, it would follow a logistic population growth curve, right? Follows a curve, looks something like that. Okay? Well, I think that's what we should fit to those data. I think we should fit a curve that looks like that to those data, okay? So it's going to asymptote out at 1, and it can't be less than 0. If we do it in that way, and we want to know how much area is that 50% probability, we're just going to find 0.5 right there. There it is. That's the distance. That's the area of effect, okay? So the question is, how do we get to that curve? Two ways to do it. The brute force way and the easy way. Now the, I'm going to show you the brute force way. I've not yet figured out how to do the easy way in R. The easy way in SAS is simple. Okay? I will get there with R. I will show you how to do it in R. I've just not figured it out quite yet. Let me show you the brute force way. This line right here really has the following form. That's really y is equal to e raised to the power beta 0 plus beta 1 x divided by 1 plus e raised to the power beta 0 plus beta 1 x. So, if you were to take the log of that, you would discover that, yeah, it's exactly right. Okay? That's the brute force way of doing it. All it is, is the data transformation. Okay? Is there a simpler way to do it? And the answer is, yeah, you betcha. What's the simpler way to do it? What, we're want, what we want to do is something called the logit transformation. The logit transformation looks like this. If these response variables are p, we're going to take p prime is equal to the log of p divided by 1 minus p. There it is. So when we do that, we fit our linear regression of p prime against distance, and it gives us exactly that curve. There is only one minor thing that we have to worry about. And that is, there's going to be a certain amount of pull on this relationship. Not all of these observations are being treated equally. Some of these observations are going to have greater weight than others. Some will have less weight than others. So usually what we have to do is we have to employ a weighted regression. In other words, we want to develop some way of giving more importance to some observations than other observations so that 
When we look at the plot of residuals, and that's going to be linear, when we look at the plot of residuals, all these points are going to go around that plot, around that line, in a nice, even way. Okay. Does that make sense? That's where we're going to stop today. I will provide you with that data set. Um, well, let, let me do this instead. Well, I will provide you with two data sets. Um, I have here my data set for, um, for these distance data. And I will provide you also with what the plots look like um, when you do it in um, SAS. Unfortunately, I've not yet figured out how to do it in R. Um, but I'll show you how to do all those plots in SAS. I will provide you with that data set. Let's not make that do uh, for the next week, because I still need to figure that out. What I will do, however, is this. I'm going to provide you with the data set um, involving a spline. Okay. So I want you to be able to use indicator variables. You're going to work through the indicator variables, and I'm then going to give you a scenario where I ask you to pinpoint where some key change has taken place. So for example, um, the data set that I'm going to give you concerns diets uh, in some um, in a sugar glider colony that we had. We had these sugar gliders, and we fed them on two different diets. And we were trying to figure out how we can get these guys reproducing in the lab. So we were feeding them a diet and then weighing them. And what we did was uh, we took one group of sugar gliders and we fed them on a dry diet and weighed them over a two-week period and track their body weight on that dry diet. And their body weights, here's weight, and this is day. Their body weights did that. And then what I did is change their diet, so I flipped them. And they now went on a wet diet instead of a dry diet. So they went from eating these little pellets and things of that sort to getting yogurt and baby food and cereal powder and stuff like that. Their body weights went up like that. Well, that's a regression problem using indicator variables. So I'll provide you with the commands necessary to get that spline and to produce that graph. And the question is, is that point right there significant? Is that a significant inflection point? And you'll be able to see that from the results that you get. Okay, that's referred to as a spline. When we start looking at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, we're going to do the same thing. We'll look at the growth of the stock market under President A, and then the growth of the stock market under President B, and we'll ask the question, is that point right there significant? How do you know it's significant? If that indicator variable is significant. So if that indicator variable is significant, you know then that that slope changes. Because in reality, that line goes off like that, and that line continues on like that, and you're just looking at that inflection point right there. Okay? So that's the, you know, the question that you asked earlier, males, females, something like that. Yeah. Is that, well, if we set it up as a spline, then yeah. Okay, yeah. That's how we figure that out. Okay? All right. All right, so I'll provide you with the, the sugar glider data. I need to dig them up. Um, I'll provide you with the commands to do that. Um, and then I will also figure out how to do the logit transformation in R uh, so that you can easily get the results and plot, do the plots for that, okay? When we come back next time, we'll talk briefly about that logit, or about that logistic regression. Um, but then what I want to do is I want to shift gears and talk about um, stepwise multiple regression. 
So we'll do a little, we'll, we'll use an example on polynomial regression, and then we'll jump right ahead into multiple regression, and stepwise multiple regression. And that's where um, you might have 20 or 30 different predictors, and you want to find out which ones are meaningful, which ones are not. Uh, you want to simplify your approach. The, the best example I can give you of that one of the things, a project that I was working on years ago, I was looking at species diversity of lizards um, across the southwestern United States. And I had 21 study sites. And at each study site, I figured out what the species diversity of lizards was, and I measured all these climate parameters and all of these vegetation parameters and all, I just, I had probably 40 different predictor variables, but I only had 21 sites. So I have 21 data points, and I have like 40 different variables that are used to predict what's happening in those 21 data sets. Well, you can't do that, right? You need 10 observations per parameter. So if I have 21 observations, that means I can basically come up with two of those variables that are going to be predictors. So somehow I have to sort through all those 40 to find out which two are meaningful. And I did that with a stepwise regression. And it turns out that when you do that, I only needed two variables to predict 90% of what was going on in terms of species diversity. And it made perfect sense. For lizards, obviously what matters to a lizard is temperature, right, and how long the growing season is. And those are the two variables that pop up, temperature and growing season. So. It worked. All right, that's it. I will get up to speed on R for logistic regression, and we'll meet again next time. Within a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be delving into more complicated um, multivariate sorts of stuff. So you'll, no you'll notice that there's less and less and less math, right? And more. We've done the math, we know about variance and all of that sort of stuff and sums of squares. We can leave all that behind. Now it's basically just the ideas. So in that regard, it should be easier.